So our next speaker is James Pfeiffer, who's the associate professor in the Department of in the Department of Global Health and the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he's also the executive director of Health Alliance International, which is a U.S. nonprofit that's affiliated with the University of Washington and that focuses on strengthening primary health care in the public sector. James has, has, um, has focused his academic work on global health activism, accountability mechanisms for international NGOs, and HIV care and treatment scale-up. And today will talk to us about the NGO accountability crisis in global health. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction. Um, uh, as was stated, I wear two hats. Um, one as a uh, professor in, in uh, Department of Global Health is my main um, appointment, and I am the token anthropologist there. I'm, I'm seen as the qualitative research guy, and that will become important in a minute. Um, I'm also in the Department of Anthropology, but I'm also executive director of something called Health Alliance International, which uh, is celebrating its 30, 30th anniversary. We started work in Mozambique in the late 1980s. I'm going to talk a lot about the Mozambique example. Um, and we are, HAI is actually the North American representative for the People's Health Movement. That sounds very grand. People's Health Movement, unfortunately, is, is not as big and, and amazing as, it, as we hope it will be someday, uh, but gives you sort of a sense of our orientation. Um, HAI also is important to what I'm going to say today to kind of describe my positionality a little bit. Um, we are a, on the one hand, a 501c3 nonprofit, and we have our offices in Seattle next to the UW uh, campus, um, but we're also within the Department of Global Health, and so we kind of have our cake and eat it too. We get to charge non-university overhead rates. There's a whole story there. Our motto is we live in the gray area. So I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about that relationship as well. Um, again, part of our positionality is that HEI really grew out of the uh, anti-apartheid movement, and it was founded by some uh, folks, Steve Gloyd, George Povey, and others, who were North American health workers who, during the Renamo War uh, that was funded by apartheid South Africa, worked within the, the nascent Mozambique health system that was developed. Uh, Samora Michel was the first president. He was a nurse by training. And the Mozambique uh, National Health System was seen as a model of sort of the Alma Ata idea of primary health care. So there were uh, health activists, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers who went to work with inside the system itself. They worked as district doctors, uh, they worked in the medical school, they, they were part of the public system. And that's really part of the HAI DNA. That's where we got started. Uh, as hopefully many of you know, um, well, we worked at something called the Mozambique Support Network, which was led by a guy named Prexy Nesbitt, who some of you might know from Chicago, a very well-known anti-racist organizer. Um, uh, Nelson Mandela ended up marrying uh, Grasa Michelle, the uh, uh, former wife of Samora Michelle, so literally the marriage of the anti-apartheid movement and the Mozambique Support Movement became, became real. Um, this is a shot from the divestment movement from Harvard. I'm hoping that some of you might have been in the crowd back there. I don't know, possibly. Um, but that's uh, part of our DNA as an organization is rooted in the public sector, in the national health system, and building that health system. So I want to talk about uh, our work from that perspective. Um, Randall Packer just gave a great uh, kind of summary here. I don't have to belabor this point too much, but. Um, I think, as all of you know, there's just been an explosion of non-governmental organizations in the health sector. When I talk about NGOs here, I'm going to be talking more about the implementing ones, not so much nonprofits that are doing human rights work and, and advocacy work, but those that are sort of on the ground, like care and save the children, those kinds of things. Um, the uh, you know explosion of NGOs really can't be separated from the problem of, of debt throughout the uh, uh, developing world. Structural adjustment programs, which were uh, cutting uh, expenditures in public sectors, whether that's health or education. Um, as hopefully most of you know, structural adjustment was a, the World Bank's own term. They abandoned that term with the IMF and embraced something called poverty reduction strategies or poverty reduction strategy papers by the early 2000s, which is sort of the ultimate Orwellian uh, euphemism you could come up with, really kind of poverty creation strategies. Um, but this was followed by a huge increase in development assistance for health when we look at some of those numbers. So you have at the same time austerity and cuts to public programming uh, while you have a huge, huge increase in aid coming uh, from the West to developing countries. And this uh, contributed to the growth and proliferation of NGOs in global health. 
Um, so these are some graphs that are produced by our colleagues at, at University of Washington, IHME, uh, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a bit, in Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. These are uh, just four different depictions of the massive you know, uh, quintupling of what they call development assistance for health. Uh, globally, that the IHME has gathered the data to kind of come up with the first good uh, uh, numbers. Um, but what I wanted to point out here, it's kind of hard to read from where you are, but this is a graph that shows the inter what they call the intermediate channel, kind of where does the money go? And it's divided here by the bilaterals, uh, Global Fund, Gavi, WHO. And then this chunk here uh, is um, United States NGOs and international NGOs, which is this segment here, and you can see that's gotten bigger and bigger. But the point I want to make here is that, in fact, this really undercounts the role of NGOs in uh, uh, development aid, that most of this funding here is actually United States bilateral funding, UK funding. Most of this, 90% of this, is actually going to NGOs. I mean, NGOs are getting the lion's share of this development assistance for health. It's not going to build public uh, sector national health systems. So that's what I want to kind of emphasize today. That's probably not news to you. This is just a graph showing some, uh, uh, you know, the, the massive increase. Nobody knows how many NGOs there are. There's around 25, 30,000 with a confidence interval of 10,000. Um, hard to know how many there are. At the same time, and we've alluded, other folks have alluded to this uh, today, has been a big push in global health toward uh, data and big data. And you may have heard this, uh, this new terminology that's floating. I, I first saw it in Fortune magazine as data is the new oil. Well, that's true in global health as, as well. Big data is where the action is. Everyone's pushing for more and more data <coughs> under this guise of, uh, of accountability and evaluation. Um, I think exemplified mostly by the creation of IHME, of those who don't know about it, led by Chris Murray, who used to be here at Harvard got pulled to Seattle by the Gates Foundation and with a $100 million grant to create the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle. Um, not sure if this news has trickled out uh, uh, outside of Seattle, but uh, just a few months ago, Gates announced that they're going to be giving half a billion dollars to the IHME through the University of Washington to expand their work. So $500 million. They're going to get a $200 million building of their own. So, um, you know, and Gates is an agenda setter. So what's the agenda? The agenda is data collection. Um, and I just, I wish I could have started this whole talk with Randall Packard's last slide. <laughs> if only I had better data. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think most of you know about the DALI and the global burden of disease. The global burden of disease is what the IHME does, what Chris Murray's been doing for years filled with lots of really interesting, uh, good data. They publish their stuff in full volumes of The Lancet. Just uh, next week, um, the Global Burden of Disease is going to be celebrating its 20 years. They're going to have their big celebration at the University of Washington. None other than Bill Gates himself is going to speak, and Jim Kim is going to fly in from the World Bank to speak. So just to kind of put a punctual uh, exclamation point on the future is all about data collection. Um, we talked a little bit about you know, how all of this is related to cost effectiveness, which was rolled out with privatization. Terms like return on investment, uh, vertical funding, business models, the language of privatization that has gotten into the global health enterprise. Uh, these are the kind of terms you see now in all the RFAs coming out these days for work. You know, what's your ROI, those kinds of things. How are you going to measure it? Uh, and what we've, uh, we're experiencing as HAI, as an implementer, we get grants from PEPFAR, we get grants from WHO, grants from all the big actors an increasing kind of emphasis on massive data collection where you have to have whole huge staff uh, 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 components that are, that are basically just collecting data to channel up to your donors. Um, many, many parallel systems of data collection. And people have been coming up with this term of audit culture, which I think is very appropriate. Uh, many recipients of aid are just living in constant fear of, of having to generate huge amounts of data, not just about program, but also about how the money's being spent. And what I want to focus on here is uh, <coughs> ironic or perhaps not so ironic that most of this audit culture misses what I would argue are the most important things that, uh, de that uh, development assistance for health should be doing. You see an amazing lack of information on fundamental health system metrics, right? Coverage, how many health systems or how many health uh, facilities have water, how many have electricity, how, what, are, what are the health work ratios looking like? Um, 
very few metrics on, on actual NGO budgeting and spending. It's just amazing how opaque uh, NGO uh, uh, budgets actually are. Um, we aren't particularly forthcoming with our own budgets. We're part of the problem. But people just don't share that information for a lot of the obvious reasons. And it's a basic measure that we're missing around. If we're really serious about cost effectiveness, why in the world aren't we actually looking at what NGOs are actually spending? So there's a huge kind of mismatch. I'm going to just talk briefly about Mozambique just to kind of flesh out, I think, what is a great uh, specific case of this. Um, Mozambique began its uh, structural adjustment program in 1987, and that kind of austerity has really continued to this day. And it, now it's called a, a, a poverty reduction strategy paper since about 2001 or so. But, but austerity has been the name of the game in Mozambique, right? Keeping hiring caps, even though the IMF says they don't have hiring caps, they do. They tell the public sector you can only hire X number of people. Um, uh, we also have this surge in Depart uh, development assistance for health in the 2000s. And in Mozambique itself, it looks a lot like that global graph. It just shot up, it quintupled, in fact. Um, there were about 477 prime partners in the health sector uh, in fiscal year 2008. Um, I want to talk a bit about PEPFAR with a few caveats. I want to agree that, that, that PEPFAR overall, I don't want to suggest that it shouldn't be there. It's been really critical to getting people onto antiretroviral treatment. Huge successes can be attributed to it, but there's been some real problems and we need to continue to critique how PEPFAR has been handled. Um, but if you look just at Mozambique alone, an estimated three to four billion dollars have gone to Mozambique alone. It's one of the key countries, uh, target countries for PEPFAR uh, since 2004. 1.5 billion just from 10, 2010 to 2016. PEPFAR comes with massive data collection demands. If you've ever, I don't know if, if anyone here has worked as a PEPFAR implementing partner, you have, you have to hire dozens of staff just to manage the kind of data collection. And PEPFAR is famous for having data collection schemes that are completely separate and parallel from national health system data collection schemes. So you have this very strange kind of investment in all this data collection, which doesn't strengthen the local institutions at all. Um, and then with this, anemic uh, uh, health system growth. And I'll look at some numbers. Where did all this money go? Um, I actually think this is a really good research question. We were taught, somebody else mentioned a, a bad research question. I think this is a good research question. We should all be asking, where is this money going? And strangely enough, we don't actually have the data and the metrics to, to, to know where it's going. Um, really quickly, this is kind of a wonky slide, but um, our, our group just published a paper on something called the sector-wide approach to planning in Mozambique. And this just shows a, a simple depiction. People get confused, like all this money is going to health in Mozambique. Why isn't the health system growing? The reality is the way that structural adjustment works is it prevents uh, the aid money from flowing on budget, right? The, the government has told you this is your budget envelope. This is how much you get. Even if donors wanted to put the money on budget, they can't, right? They're prohibited from doing that. That's the way structural adjustment works. It's often kind of a, me a mechanism that is not fully uh, viewed uh, on view for the public, but that's what goes on. It often happens behind closed doors. Most of the money is going, what, what they call it, off budget. And so PEPFAR is off budget and many, many, many other millions and millions of dollars of uh, donor money that including from UNICEF, including from other uh, bilaterals, is actually flowing from NGOs, doesn't go uh, on budget, therefore is not going into investing in the basics of the health system. It's going somewhere else. Um, this is, again, Mozambique health sector financing, just depicting it from, we start about 2009. The good news here, to be optimistic, is that the total is, seems to be growing a lot. Um, but if you go back to 2009, this purple is off-budget resources. So this is a lot of this is PEPFAR money and other money. The blue here is the money controlled in principle by the state budget. So you can see that about two-thirds of the money flowing into the health care sector was not actually flowing into the national health system. It's going to a bunch of NGOs, basically. Now, notice that a bunch of this is, uh, this budget has actually increased. That's a good sign. There's sort of a complicated story behind that, but it's still not even near where it needs to be to begin to have adequate health resources. Um, you notice this is basically the PEPFAR uh, mostly PEFAR, not only, that's continuing at quite a high level, but still about half the budget is really not under the control of the Ministry of Health. So you have this huge amount of resources that's going to NGOs. The NGOs aren't sort of this problem on the margins. 
I would want to make the case that in many African countries, this is the principal challenge of global health now, is the money going to private NGOs and not to build public, public systems. Um, so this is just another way to depict it. Uh, percentage of PEFAR funding by prime partner. This just again shows how much is going to local governments by fiscal year uh, 2010, about 11%. This is not for Mozambique, this is more broadly. Um, about only 11% is actually going into some kind of government uh, uh, budgets. 54% for nonprofits, 14% for profits. And I'm not sure, some of those are pharmaceuticals, some of those are, are organizations like ABT, which are for, for profit contractors, Beltway Bandits, uh, and then 20% for academia. But all of that money, by far the biggest chunk of, of funding going into many African countries' health sectors is not going to the actual health system where people get their care. James, is that 20% of people? You know, this was, I tried to go into this report, it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated, because some of it actually includes... Um, they deliver care. Some. some of them deliver care, and that's what, there is quite a, speaking of gray areas, ICAP, for example, is Columbia University, acts like an NGO, Vanderbilt, uh, big PEPFAR partners, which actually are based in universities, and HAI, we're actually kind of University of Washington. And uh, when I read into the report, I wasn't sure how they were characterizing that, but it's sort of a mix. So, you know, what's happening with this? So this money's going to what they call PEPFAR implementing partners. So 90% so of the money is going to basically American NGOs, nonprofits, um, and they're called these implementing partners. And it's fascinating, I was in the middle of this. So as an anthropologist, I was doing ethnography on the world of aid, um, participant observation. And I just wanted to tell a story about sitting in a room in what's called the JAT building, a beautiful, kind of the nicest building in Maputo in the capital of Mozambique. Meeting called by USAID and CDC to talk about how are the PEFAR implementing partners uh, going to divide up Mozambique? How are we gonna do our work? How's it gonna happen? And so my next picture is a photograph of that meeting. Uh, <laughs> No, that's, that's not an actual <laughs> photograph. Um, Randall Packard may know the provenance of this drawing, but what, what this is is a depiction of, anybody know what conference this is, where this was? Berlin, 1884, 1885. This was really where the scramble for Africa uh, began. Joanna Crane's book called Scrambling for Africa, same idea. Um, the reason why I thought this image was good is because after this meeting I'm talking about, um, there was I and a guy named Kenny Scher, were a couple of white guys from America, were sitting around a table that looked a lot like this with a map that looked a lot like this with a bunch of other Americans um, with USAID and PEPFAR, and we're literally saying, well, where's HAI going to work? Well, you're going to work in TET. Are you going to do TET, or, or is, is, is Vanderbilt going to do TET province? Who's going to do NIASA? We're dividing up the country and deciding where we're gonna do work. There's not a single African in the room, right? And I've always thought that's what I've heard about the Berlin Conference. You know, you see all these, all these European guys uh, dividing up Africa, and I thought, well, it's pretty good. And we came out of that meeting, and so said that was kind of like the Berlin Conference, wasn't it? <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's kind of what it looked like. This is me over here <laughs> when I had a beard. Um, but, you know, ABT, this is one of the big, you know, Beltway Bandit contractors. Um, uh, the Vanderbilt group, and you know, there's a lot of, I, I, I wanna, you know, I know this is being recorded, so I am biting the hand that feeds me, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. Some great people doing some work on some of these organizations, but the overall structure is extremely problematic. FHI 360 is, I believe, the single biggest recipient of PEPFAR uh, funding globally, and it gets, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from PEPFAR. Uh, so you've got a real scene here where the Ministry of Health and National Health System is completely disempowered. <coughs> This is just another example I'd show of the kind of the logo mania that I think we're all used to now. You know, this is just, this is uh, uh, advertising a meeting sponsored by the local NGO uh, uh, association, uh, the, fifth, uh, the fifth annual F ONG NGO fair working in, in, uh, in health and HIV. This is just HIV. And, uh, you know, here's all of the different presenters. You know, you got all the usual suspect HAIs in there, my group, Chipago. Uh, path, you know, all of the usual suspects, and, and, and sort of this crazy logo mania. You walk around Maputo, and one SUV after another flies by with its logo flashing, and uh, I think most of you are familiar with that scene, but it's really, you know, there's, there, there's no <coughs> ministry presence at a fair like this, right? There's no actual health system people there. Um, so 
somebody, I can't remember who came up with this term. Um, actually, I do know this is, I think Paul Farmer rolled out this idea during the, during the Ebola crisis, which I think is a great way to say it. What was the impact of all this stuff on the things that really matter, right? Which a good way to say it is staff, stuff, space, and systems. So I wanted to use, this is a quote from the OGAC uh, PEPFAR fiscal year uh, congressional budget justification supplement. So they're arguing to the Congress about about the funding. OGAC is the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, who's the head of PEPFAR. And just wanted to highlight, this is in their own words, about Mozambique. They're talking about Mozambique specifically. Uh, more than half of all Mozambicans walk over one hour to reach the nearest health facility. 55% la lack electricity. 41% lack running water. 41% of the health system health facilities don't have water. Only five doctors and 24 nurses, 429 social workers in the country. Mozambique faces one of the most critical uh, human resources for health shortages in the world. Uh, information systems and monitoring and evaluation, evaluation efforts are generally unable to provide timely and accurate health system data. Perfectly stated, but coming from PEPFAR is just sort of mind-blowing. It's like you just spent about $4 billion, and you actually have hardly made a dent in the basic, most important indicators of how a health system <coughs> works. Um, this is just another little data point I squeezed in here from uh, the Ministry of Health document, the ratio of health facilities per capita has actually worsened since 2009 to reach only one per almost 17,000 inhabitants. I'm also among the very lowest in the world. So after $4 billion of investment, which is in some ways either doubled or tripled the Ministry of Health's own budget, we're, we're actually going backwards on some key measures of coverage. I mean, there's something terribly wrong going on here. Now, I, I do, I do want to again say that PEPFAR has also enabled uh, you know, millions of people to get onto antiretroviral treatment. I don't want to suggest that PEPFAR hasn't done really, really important stuff, especially for the camera, um, for benefit of the camera. But, but there's something basically very wrong here. And I think there are a number of people within PEPFAR that actually understand this and get this. And so that's a complicated question as well. Um, you know, one of the things you hear if you're doing a lot of implementation work, task shifting, you know, about every NIH uh, application, R01 application now that has to do with implementation science involves task shifting. Well, why do you do task shifting? Because there aren't enough higher level health workers. You're shifting tasks down to lower level health workers. So you're sort of saying, how do we deal with the fact that there aren't enough health workers? What we found, we want to write a piece about this, and this is a shot from the Beira uh, Central Hospital. These are maternal child health nurses. They are the focus. MCH nurses are the focus of so much global health work. They're doing all the heavy lifting. And when we interviewed them for a project we wanted to do, they said, you know what? You're like the sixth organization to come to us. We're doing this for Japigo. We're doing this for ICAP. We're doing this for another NGO. And now you're asking to say, so they're getting more and more tasks shifted onto them. So it's more like task multiplication, the limited number of health workers doing more and more. Uh, just an example of how deep the crisis is, um, we did a uh, <laughs> Uh, special implementation kind of pilot intervention with the ministry on improving adherence to um, uh, antiretrovirals among HIV positive pregnant women, so sort of helping them scale up what's called option B plus. And we found that in the key biggest health centers along the Bayer Corridor, the most important ones and some of the highest HIV prevalence uh, areas in the country, they didn't have filing cabinets. They had an average of five to seven hour wait before they get seen for a seven minute appointment to be tested for HIV and counseled and the whole works. And we're going, wait a minute, this is where ABT and FHI just spent about $300 million. Why are these key health centers don't have filing cabinets? Why is the roof leaking? Why is there one maternal child health nurse that has to, has to see like 300 people? So it's just why, you know, and what, why isn't it getting measured? I mean, that was the other thing. You go back into the PEPFAR reports, you get back, none of this is getting captured, right? None of this is being measured in the, in the audit culture. Um, so uh, having laid out, I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but uh, trying to tell a story here. There have been some attempts to make it better, and I, I don't have a lot of time to get into these, but maybe we can break them out in the discussion. There's something called the sector-wide approach to planning that some of you might be familiar with. We've seen this implemented in a number of African countries. Mozambique started this in about 1999. And the idea is that you bring together donors and they usually contribute to a common fund which is jointly managed by the um, uh, Ministry of Health with the donors, right? So it helps put the ministry in the driver's seat. Um, it's been tough. Uh, it's had some successes in Mozambique. There's more money has flown into the system to, to some extent. 
But along came PEPFAR, and PEPFAR said, no, nope, we're not going to be part of the swap. We're going to be separate. So the biggest elephant in the room, the biggest actor, is not part of the sector-wide approach. So it's created a, a basic challenge there. Paris Declaration was alluded to, followed up by the ACRA Agenda for Action, um, without getting, going into too much detail, sort of these grand statements, good statements about aid coordination, not having too many donors stumbling over each other, trying to get people on the same page. I think I would say it's tough to measure, but I think, I think most people here would probably agree it hasn't been all that effective, but it's an attempt. Um, HAI, along with Partners in Health, Action Aid, Rick Rowden is here and was involved in some of this at the beginning. I believe you, you helped with this. Um, we rolled out something called the NGO Code of Conduct for Health System Strengthening, and there's still a website for this, and I wanted to just talk about it quickly. And this included uh, several provisions. One of the things we noticed with NGOs is, number one, we think there's, there's too much money going to NGOs, but assuming that's still going to be going on, what can they do better? And one of the things they really need to stop doing is poaching really talented healthcare workforce from the public system into NGOs. Huge problem. You hear a lot about external brain drain, brain drain but internal brain drain might be even worse for public national health systems. Um, so hiring practices that assure long-term long uh, health system sustainability, compensation practices that strengthen the public sector, um, trying to limit pay inequity. Um, we actually did a little study on uh, Mozambican doctors. And basically, the average uh, pay for a Mozambican doctor with an NGO is literally 10 times what they get in the public sector. So who's going to turn that down, right? You can't blame them for leaving the public sector and working for an NGO. Um, compensating community health workers, human resources support for local health systems. I'll just go through these kind of quickly. We think there should be more NGO management to support ministries. Um, management is a huge problem for them. Um, I had the provincial director of Sofala province once approached us and said, hey, we really appreciate HAI's help, but what I really need is a director of human resources and I need some IT specialists. Nobody's supporting this basic stuff that I actually need. Um, we did manage to publish a couple pieces advocating for this. Um, this is a consortium. I'll show you some of the other NGOs that signed on. This is from the American Journal of Public Health, and it was followed up by uh, a piece in The Lancet a couple years ago saying that NGO code of conduct is only going to work if donors embrace it, right? It's donors who really call the shots. NGOs will do what donors tell them to do. You can't read that here, but one of our uh, illustrious co-authors on this piece was none other than Aaron Shackow, M.A., he is now Dr. Shackow, but uh, was actually helped us uh, when, when Aaron worked in, in Seattle um, a number of years ago. So tried to get it out there, tried to, 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 to you know, generate interest in this. Um, uh, we got some uh, over 60 signatories, um, which you know, in the world of 30,000 NGOs isn't many, but some very prominent ones. Partners in Health, for example, actually helped put, put some of this together. Uh, Action Aid, Health Gap, Physicians for Human Rights, Health Alliance. This is just a, just a sampling. Um, we have the website, done a number of panels, uh, gone to PEPFAR meetings, uh, advocating for it. Um, USAID even suggested that they had some interest in it. Um, and sort of a recognition that, yes, there's a problem with the poaching of health workforce. But I would say, you know, we are probably need to, to move on from this to uh, some, some new idea, which is what I want to uh, throw out here. I think toward a new a new architecture of accountability, and I, I love this term of failing better. We failed before, and to be optimistic, I, I hope we can fail better with this idea I want to sort of advance here. Um, to kind of cap on some of the other ideas that people have brought up, we're thinking a new approach <clears throat> really does need to focus on bottom up. Um, you need to, we need to figure out better ways to empower local communities and local ministries of health and public sector systems to fight back and to push back. Um, embolden local movements, the Ministry of Health, create perhaps an organizing handle um, and some way to keep not just NGOs <coughs> accountable but their donors, right? Donors are the real drivers. And uh, one of our pieces, we actually got the Doris Duke Charitable uh, Foundation to sign on, uh, Lola, Lola Adodekun, who's, who took over from Mary Bassett. Um, and the, the Doris Duke Foundation has been very interestingly very supportive of health system strengthening work. And so we've been funded by them for a number of years. Uh, so getting donors, and they've been working on pushing this idea with other donors as well. Um, you know, it is, I, I guess, quixotic. It's a little bit, I'm trying to be optimistic here. We know that these efforts aren't necessarily going to change uh, everything overnight, but we've got to try. Um, I just, uh, real quickly, I want to say why now. <coughs> People have mentioned the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. 
This 3.8, uh, number three is, is the health goal. 3.8 is specifically the one on universal health coverage, and it's interesting how much it's getting some attention. It's, it's, people are beginning to pay attention to it. Um, you know, we don't know what universal health co coverage necessarily means, but it really does shift attention to, to systems. Um, also, I think the recognition of the end of AIDS is people doing real work uh, around HIV care. You realize you cannot move any further without major health system strengthening expansion. It just cannot be done. Adherence can't be maintained over a long period without health systems. And even people in PEPFAR get that. So I think there's the potential here. Um, and I put this just came out right before I came out to Seattle. This is a, a, a Gates Foundation uh, RFA, request for applications for uh, um, grand challenges. And I don't know if you know about Gates. They do these things, these small grand challenges. Uh, 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 proposals, and I don't know if you can read this, but they literally have this language in here, which I found kind of hopeful. You can be cynical, but I found somewhat hopeful. One criticism of the MGGs is that gains were largely made by focusing on specific diseases and populations and favoring vertical strategies done at the expense of comprehensive measures to strengthen health systems and health care delivery. Our jaws dropped when we saw that. It's like, oh, that was a criticism of the MDGs. Uh, that's kind of a criticism that's been leveled at Gates up until now. But it's nice to see them, again, for the cameras, nice to see Gates <laughs> paying attention to this. Um, the fall, the follow-on call to action to the MGEs, the Sustainable Development Goals, shifted the global focus to quality of services, which should translate specific <coughs> intervention coverage to stronger systems and good health outcomes. Wow, I mean, that's like really, this is, you know, Gates is an agenda setter. Somebody in Gates is trying to move the needle on this because this is really not where they've been historically. And they cite the sustainable development goals. So maybe there's a little bit of hope that this, by having this SDG 3.8 out there, that, that, that the needle will move a little bit. Uh, very quickly, possible models and frameworks. We've just heard about how the human rights framework has, could fail better. Um, the ILO Convention 169, International Labor Organization, is about indigenous rights. Is that a possible framework that we can build on to, for NGO accountability? There's the 1981 WHO International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. Could we do something similar with the WHO to say the WHO needs to make a, re a referenceable statement about what NGOs should be doing around health system strengthening? Then there's the 2010 WHO Global Code of Practice on International Recruitment of Health Personnel to stem brain drain from the global south to the global north. And one of the co-authors actually on the paper for this piece, Amy Hagopian, was, was involved in, in making that happen. Um, and so she, she wanted us to think about this. Uh, she attended the World Health Assembly in May uh, 2010, and it has a series of, of things that uh, uh, need to be adhered to. It's voluntary, unfortunately. It's you know voluntary accountability. It's an oxymoron. Um, but a possible model, it gave activists a handle to organize around this issue uh, is the argument. So I wanted to, uh, this is sort of too much words on a, a PowerPoint slide, but I thought I would just uh, quickly make a proposal here. I'd love to hear uh, how crazy this actually sounds. But taking our code of conduct and turning it more <coughs> into a WHO uh, NGO code of practice for health system strengthening, include those code of conduct provisions emphasize collaboration with local ministries to avoid creation of parallel systems of delivery. Delivery. So when PEPFAR comes in, wants to collect data, might, you know, strengthen the national health system data collection system. Why are you doing a whole parallel thing, investing this huge amount of money? It's, it's sort of crazy. Provision of financial material support to public systems, capacity building for public sector health workers, uh, piloting innovative programs. Um, there are things that NGOs can do that are positive. They can bring a certain dynamism. They can bring new ideas. Uh, into health systems. Um, very importantly, provide transparent budgets for health sector planners to track impact and assess cost effectiveness. If we're going to use this term cost effectiveness, let's apply it to, uh, uh, to NGOs. I just have a picture here of what I think we, we would like to think is a potential model. We've helped the Ministry of Health develop a, a research center on, uh, it's called an operations research center, where we do implementation science within the health system. And we bring resources and, and researchers from the University of Washington and side by side with Ministry of Health researchers figuring out how to make delivery work better rather than doing it ourselves as a separate thing. Um, so I, very importantly, we've been sort of decrying the emphasis on data. But you know, it's good to have data to hold, hold people accountable. Um, and so if we were able to get a code of practice put together, 
uh, if there was some kind of agreement. Um, what are the indicators to measure adherence to that? Um, so NGO budget indicators, including percentage spent on expat salaries and benefits, home country offices, NGO offices in country, right? Really seeing where this money is going. And I can tell you the lavish offices of many of our NGO partners in, in Maputo, for example, the capital of Mozambique, are unreal. To move from the ABT or the FHI office and go to the Ministry of Health office down the street, night and day, right? It's, it's sort of the uh, classic example of uh, private op opulence, public squalor uh, that we're seeing in global health. Um, doing implementation research projects. They, they would like to have more skill building around that. NGOs might be able to do some of that. We should be measuring the number of trained workers added to the health system, right? After you've finished your $300 million PEPFAR uh, uh, project, why don't we measure how, many, how much the health, health workforce has grown? Um, and then the impact of NGO investment on expanding health service coverage and access. How many health services have, uh, health facilities now have electricity and water after you left, right? Those kinds of things. Really basic stuff that, there's, that we should be tracking. And this is my last slide. What can a code do? Again, I think, you know, whether this is in the real world, it's going to be tough, but we provide a global consensus on minimum expe expectations and ethical standards to hold donors and NGOs accountable. Do you have something that people have agreed upon? At the moment, there's really nothing out there that really allows you to say what an NGO should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Um, it's a basis for measurement of NGO impact. Um, it can provide reporting expectations and requirements. A place for debate, uh, possibly setting up side events at World Health Assemblies to talk about uh, the tracking of NGOs. Uh, opportunities for research. Um, it can be a focal point and reference for advocates, ministries, uh, donors, and social movements. Um, possibly uh, one of our co-authors, uh, countries and donors can and put together <coughs> sort of development treaties that will ensure accountability and trans uh, transparency for how aid is allocated. Uh, Third-party tribuna tribunals could perhaps even adjudicate disputes uh, brought forth by either citizens or countries, see how aid money is, is spent. So the idea is that to create some kind of new tool in the architecture, which I think was uh, mentioned in the, the previous talk, the idea that even though it's toothless, it's something that is out there that you can reference. You can say that the, the global health community has decided that this is what NGOs should be focusing on, that health systems really matter and need to be measured. And that can provide a basis for, for ministries of health to push back, for do, like-minded donors to push back, and for social movements and activists to push back, possibly. So I'm going to stop there. Obrigado. That's how you say thank you in, in uh, Portuguese in Mozambique. And this is a typical scene of uh, dozens and dozens of women waiting, out, waiting outside maternal child health services for many, many hours because they don't have enough health workers. So I'll stop there. One final thing, we are, we are HAI is collectivist in spirit. These are my co-authors here in case you uh, care. I know Amy Hagopian is known by some folks, kind of a health resource, a human resources expert. So this is actually a collective piece in reality. <laughs>